Victor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, can you hear me with my mic? Yeah, I think you can hear me pretty well. Thanks so very, very much. Um, it's always a pleasure to be at this event, and um, I've uh, personally enjoyed seeing a lot of new and old uh, uh, faces, a lot of um, folks that uh, I've known for a long time, great researchers and, and, uh, old, and friends I've had for a long time. I don't want to say old friends. Uh, and a lot of very new people. This, is, this type of event is always great. Um, for those of you who may be new to the, uh, going to conferences based on the UFO subject, uh, you may not have known what to expect going in, but now you know. You find a lot of other people who are just like you, and you can talk to them and not feel like you're a pariah. So uh, I think I need to be very careful with this little cord here. So, <clears throat> um, so this is a fairly new lecture that I've been developing. Um, if, you're, if you're familiar with anything that I've done in the past, and you, you'll kind of get the idea that I don't, I'm not really like a, I don't do breaking news stories in the UFO field, not too much. I'll talk about contemporary events, uh, but I'm, I'm a historian, and so I like to uh, look at the long view. And what I do in lectures, and in my books, for that matter, or articles even, is uh, I like to explore. That's really what I do. So I like to explore ideas through facts, and through uh, philosophies, and through uh, scenarios, and to try to understand. That's all that I've ever been doing in the last 20 years in this field is a series of explorations to try to figure out what this, this phenomenon is. That's really it. It's that simple. Um, along the way, I, I ask myself a lot of new questions, um, dealing with the cover-up of the phenomenon. And there is absolutely a cover-up. And with um, what is the nature of the secrecy? How does it work? You know, when you talk to people who are in the outside world, the muggles, they, <laughs> they don't really get it. They think it's impossible. They actually believe that journalists are out there trying to break this story. Well, there are journalists out there trying to break the story. They're just not part of the establishment news media, for the most part. And so it's hard for a lot of people out there to understand just how crazy this system is. And I'll just give you a quick little example of what I mean before I get into the theme of the cost of secrecy. Um, you know, many, many years ago when I first researched UFOs, um, I've said this a number of times, but I really believed <laughs> that I could do this for two or three months at the most and then get out and satisfy all of my questions. Like I thought, uh, all I want to do, I don't want to get into any weird stuff, I just want to research, is there a UFO of reality? <laughs> I actually thought this. Like, no abductions, God forbid. Crop circles, are you kidding me? Animal mutilations? I don't want to go. I really told myself I did not want to go there. I only wanted to know this one little thing. Was there ever a UFO reality that was acknowledged by the United States government, military intelligence community? And if so, as people had claimed, then where is it in our official history? Why was it never in any academic history book that I ever read? Uh, so I started out with some very conservative assumptions about this subject, you know. And, um, I very quickly realized, ah, there is a reality. The government, if you want to call it that, the military absolutely took this seriously. And, and then what I realized is that that opened up an entire, it ripped down my old paradigm of what I believed was true. Back then, it was a little easier for me. I was just young enough, I was in my 30s, that my, you could say maybe my worldview hadn't completely, totally, forever solidified. Because I feel that this often happens to people. You know, you get to a certain age and, and you, you more or less stop wanting to reinvent your worldview. Unless, unless your experience in ripping open that worldview and then you keep doing it for the rest of your life. That's, that's actually what I do and I think what many of you do now. But, um, so all I wanted to say is that the, um, this phenomenon has forced me, and I know it's forced most of you out there, to rethink certain really fundamental things that you grew up thinking were just not to be questioned. And that's what it is like for the large number of people who are not involved in this area of study. And that goes for people who call themselves researchers in the so-called alternative community, because most of them uh, run away in terror at this subject as well. And it's unfortunate. 
because they would have a lot to learn. Uh, in fact, they really are only ever going to go so far without understanding this phenomenon. In fact, uh, when I talk about the $21 trillion that have uh, apparently gone missing from the United States Pentagon over the last two decades, you'll see. Like, they can only go so far. And then you have to confront the reality of this phenomenon that we call UFOs. And it's, it's, it's always amazed me when I encounter researchers who uh, are willing to distrust the government on every single thing except UFOs. Like, what, what is it? Like, this blind spot is a severe blind spot. You know, they'll, they'll question U.S. motives going into all the nations that it destroys. Okay, good, you should do that. They'll question U.S. motives um, relating to some, um, you know, um, MKUltra. People will, now they'll go down that road. They'll talk about MKUltra because it's, it's confirmed, mind control. And a lot of other things, and some will go into 9-11 a little bit. They'll research that. But UFOs, no, they run away. They run away because they themselves have allowed themselves to be manipulated by the CIA and, and U.S. intelligence propaganda machine. And I'll just remind you, if you don't already know, that the phrase conspiracy theorist itself was a creation of the CIA. That's the truth from 1967. And they created that phrase, just so you know, as a way of derailing and disabling an alternative theory about the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Because in 1967, there were people who thought, you know, the official conclusion <laughs> that you're coming down to doesn't quite make sense. There's problems with it. And the CIA was aware of this. And they, um, being experts in propaganda that they have always been, coined the phrase conspiracy theory as a way to use as a smear against people who question the officially sanctioned morality, uh, 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 reality. And it's been used ever since. So when you find someone who uses the phrase conspiracy theory as a way to smear you, you can actually say, good for you, you're just doing the work of the CIA, which of course will confirm to them that you are a tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist. But the fact is that it is true. It's a creation of the CIA, look it up, you'll see it's, it's exactly true. It's insidious the way the propaganda works. It, it really truly is. So this is a new lecture. I call it the cost of secrecy to, from money to mind control. And, and really what I'm, um, I'm going to try to do is to, uh, one of the things that I want to point out is to show how, how dangerous and how destructive uh, secrecy on UFOs has been to our society on every level, right down to your very psyche. It has been very destructive. And, um, and, to, and to try to understand why that secrecy is in place and to try to understand what exactly is being kept from us, that is, what's the secret infrastructure, and then finally getting into some issues as to how much might it cost. Um, so that's gonna be our, our journey for today. So I'm gonna start with UFOs, and uh, this is probably the boring part of the lecture for most of you, because you don't really need to be convinced that this is a real thing. But there's always people in, the, in an audience, and there's always people who are gonna watch this on YouTube or wherever, and they're not on the same page as you are. So I just want to point something out. Um, we, um, you know, we encounter our mainstream establishment media, and you often hear it said, you know, uh, what if they're out there? What if they're out there? As if this is how you treat the UFO phenomenon. It was like the most ridiculous, childish uh, manner of dealing with it. Um, this is a much more than what if they're out there kind of question. Um, years ago, when I was a, a little baby studying this phenomenon about uh, 20 plus years ago, I spoke to a gentleman who was from a military family, and he told me that his, this, you get this all the time, um, that his father, who was a senior officer in one of the services, and I only got this story sort of generically a long time ago, but. The dad had told son, it's real and they're here. It was a phrase that I, I've never really forgotten. And I think that's what we're dealing with. It's real, they're here, whoever they are. So um, what I will submit to you for this lecture is that this UFO phenomenon kind of inserted its, our, itself into our culture at a, at a bad time for us. Hadn't really thought about this until recently. 
Um, they inserted themselves into our culture in the 1940s and 50s, really, uh, at a moment when the global elites, the financial elites of this world, have made a move. And they have continued to make a move. And that move is to uh, initiate what I'm going to call their latest revolution. And uh, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, but first, I'll just say, look, this phenomenon, uh, if you don't believe it's legit, if you don't believe it's real, if you think this is all just misidentification, the one thing you have to know is that it has engaged strong military interest, strong, strong military interest since the 1940s. It's confirmable. If I had, a, if I had to have one debate on CNN or Fox or MSNBC or wherever, this would be the easiest debate to have that the UFO phenomenon has engaged and the US military has engaged with UFOs in a very serious way, in a way that has gotten the attention of the highest levels of our hierarchy, uh, using phrases like grave concern and perturbed by implications and all other kinds of phrases that you can think of. Uh, the military of this country, of the United States and of this country, Canada, and of European nations, and of any other nation that you can imagine, Russia, China, for sure, uh, have engaged in this phenomenon and have had real problems dealing with it. And we know this. This is not a matter of speculation. It's proof. It's not, uh, you know, we think that's the case. We know that it's the case in the form of released U.S. government declassified documents through freedom of information, which, you know, when they came out in the 70s and 80s, you would think, logically, that it would cause this upheaval in society, and it just seemed that everyone was asleep at the wheel then as now. But the evidence is absolutely there. And I'm just going to show you a couple of these documents. I'm not really going to go into a lot of details. Uh, these are little snippets that I, I just put into this slide. So from 1947, the phrase from three-star, later four-star General Nathan Twining, describing these objects as circular or elliptical in shape, flat on bottom and domed on top. That's kind of an interesting phrase going back to September 1947, one general to another in a classified memo. Yes, I think that's quite significant indeed. Or from 1949, an FBI document. Uh, no, excuse me. This is a document from uh, uh, near Kirtland Air Force Base citing January 1949 by approximately 30 people, estimate at least 100 total sightings. Then you have the Atomic Energy Commission, um, um, Air Force, uh, Special Weapons Program, I believe it was, Fourth Army, local commanders, perturbed by implications of phenomena, um, and on and on. And then this just keeps going. Uh, FBI document, flying saucers, uh, matters considered top secret by intelligence officers of the Army and Air Force. Why? Why would it be considered top secret? Well, that's an interesting question. And uh, on and on and on. This is a, a classified memo from a Canadian uh, government official, scientist, a brilliant man, Wilbert Smith, who, after going to the uh, U.S. Uh, Canadian Embassy in, in Washington in 1950, met with a very high-level scientist. We now know that his name was Robert Sarbacher, very important man. And Smith, writing to his own government in the aftermath of that, said, I've made discreet inquiries through the Canadian Embassy. Staff in Washington was able to obtain the following information, the matter that is UFOs is considered the most highly classified subject in the United States government, rating higher even than the hydrogen bomb. Flying saucers exist, um, and on and on. So, um, and then my, my favorite quote probably of, um, of all of these moments from the 1950s, a CIA document to the director of the CIA, uh, Walter Beadle Smith, a famous man in his own right. He receives this memo from his director of scientific intelligence named Chadwell, who just says, uh, you know, sightings at this time, uh, of sightings of unexplained objects at great altitudes and traveling at high speeds in the vicinity of major U.S. defense installations are of such nature that they are not attributable to natural phenomena or known types of aerial vehicles. I don't know how much more explicit you want to make a statement to the boss of the CIA that we don't know what these things are, right? So, uh, and the only thing that I will just point out to, this is, this is UFOs 101 here I'm giving you. In other words, every, for me, uh, every conversation about the phenomenon should start with these types of documents, just to get the whole thing moving. There's so much more to the phenomenon than these. Um, these are some documents dealing with nuclear missile incidents. This one, 1966, at Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota. Um, Malmstrom Air Force Base, a famous, a bunch in 1975, including in Canada, 
along the U.S. Canadian border, um, particularly well documented from the middle and later part of that year, going into 1976. Uh, hard, hard to explain, impossible to explain, really, uh, in conventional terms. Uh, violations of very sensitive airspace by objects exhibiting incredible uh, capabilities in terms of maneuverability, evasion, and so forth. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, the reality is that so someone is here with technology that's not supposed to exist, but it does exist. That's a simple thing. I come back to this every lecture, and it almost sounds like I'm a broken record, but I just feel like it's important to reiterate this point again and again. It is a phenomenon denied by the responsible authorities in our society, whether in Canada or the United States or anywhere else. And that's a problem. Some people say, well, why do we need governments to give us disclosure? We know the truth. Okay, that's, that's the case, but it does matter. It will always matter. If you care that your government is responsible to you, which you should care, because governments increasingly in this world are moving away from that as a paradigm. They are and they're becoming more opaque everywhere. And we, cannot, we cannot let that happen. So there's a disclosure of the reality of this phenomenon by official government sources remains very, very important. Not, not so that we know the truth. That's actually secondary. The main reason is so that they are responsible to us. That's the number one reason. Because I don't know about you. Yes, that's worth <laughs> applauding. I'm not interested in a disclosure from what in all intents and purposes is a fascist government. I don't want that. Uh, that's not the kind of disclosure I'm interested in. But anyway, so that's the reality. It's this great discrepancy, um, and it involves radically advanced technology. And it's radically advanced technology that's of an incalculable, possibly, value. Let's just say immense value. This is an expensive cover-up. Sometimes people think, well, why does it matter? It doesn't affect my life. It does affect your life. Because money is siphoned out of your society to pay for this. It's like there's a big hole in our global financial system and the window's open and the money is just flying out, paying for this. And it's not really not evident that we are getting much of a benefit from it. So yes, it does matter and it does affect your uh, society. Um, this reality must represent an advanced infrastructure. I don't know the details of what their infrastructure is, but it's advanced, has to be. Any object that can zigzag, any object that can stop on a dime, that can take off instantly, that has triangles that are larger than multiple football fields, all right, there's a lot of energy and infrastructure going into that, and it should matter to all of us. So, and all of it is kept secret from us, at least officially. There's folks like us who are investigating this and trying to peer into it, and um, I think many people are doing a great job with it, but officially speaking, there's this veil, there's this curtain, and it's still considered you know, a matter of ridicule to go down that road. Even, I would say, uh, after the revelations in the New York Times last December about the ATIP program, um, I'll get into that, but I would still argue that, by and large, to go down the uh, path of where I'm going to go today is, is really not done in the establishment corporate media. Um, so that's part of the reality. The other part of the reality is crash retrievals. Many of you remember Dr. Edgar Mitchell. That's us back in 2004. I had much darker hair and, and rounder glasses. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's forgotten often. Uh, every, everyone who's studied the subject knows that Edgar Mitchell was a friend of UFO research, and he absolutely was. But it's sometimes... Um, forgotten that for a good solid 10 years, from the late 90s to about uh, 2007, 2008, he made multiple public statements uh, explicitly about how he was told of uh, crash retrievals and the possession of alien bodies and technology at the deep, deep levels of the US national security apparatus uh, for a man who was on Apollo 14 to make such a statement, the sixth man on the moon, at least by the, <laughs> if, you, if you believe they went, which I do believe they went, and uh, maybe, the, but I think there were black programs as well that uh, who knows how extensive those are, but Edgar Mitchell was an, a very amazing man, uh, a brilliant man and a good man. Um, he made these statements for uh, a good solid decade, and then he started, I think, backing away from some of them and just talking a little more generically about this 
But he told me explicitly um, back at that time when I met him in 04, the first time, that um, he had two ultra elite sources who confirmed to him this, the existence of this program to study alien bodies and technology. And he said this publicly and no one in the mainstream corporate media was really willing to uh, explore that at all. Uh, another individual I've spoken to a number of occasions said to me just offhandedly almost that uh, the security on this program is quite expensive, more expensive than the scientific research and development by a magnitude of seven or eight times. That didn't give me an idea of how expensive it was, but I got the idea it was quite expensive. Um, as far as crash retrievals, there's this man, Leonard Stringfield, who uh, really opened it up. I mean, Stanton Friedman, uh, being the other really significant early person to open up crash retrievals, particularly the Roswell case. But uh, Leonard Stringfield, and I never had the pleasure to meet him, unfortunately, um, was really the one person who I think more than other, anyone else was instrumental. And um, he, had, he got dozens and then scores of firsthand accounts of people who either were directly involved in crash retrievals of UFOs or um, different types of scenarios, like the widow of someone who might have guarded uh, nine alien bodies at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in the 1960s. That was one of his stories. And then the husband died, and he had told his wife, and she told Stringfield. Stories like that. Uh, some were indirect, some were direct. Uh, all of them were interesting. They all pointed in the same direction. This is back in the 70s and 80s, when getting into crash retrievals was a very, very new thing for UFO research. And again, I don't think it's necessary for me to go into all of these details. They are fascinating. If you've got your camera, you can take a picture. <laughs> but uh, the, I've, I've discussed this many times, and so have other, lots of other folks. Um, you know, any one of these stories by themselves is not proof, OK, that this is a reality, this crash retrieval. But the thing is that Stringfield was a very careful man and uh, collected um, quite a large number of these stories. And he's only one researcher. There's so many of these others now. They keep coming out. These are not make-believe. These are real people. You've got the uh, testimony of someone like James Goodall, who I uh, had the pleasure to meet on one occasion. James Goodall is not really so much a UFO uh, researcher. He's an aerospace aviation researcher, and particularly in the 80s and 90s, was uh, going full guns uh, researching down at Groom Lake in Area 51 and everything related to it. Uh, developed a lot of very good contacts at that time and uh, talked quite, quite explicitly about at least eight black programs that he knew, that is, ultra-secret programs flying out of Groom Lake, not counting the B-2 stealth bomber, which everyone knew about, uh, one of which was a, a silent flying triangle. So even in the 1980s, when Goodall was getting these stories, we're getting evidence of our own infrastructure to try to replicate or to create its own version of flying saucer technology. Again, it's... <clears throat> doesn't count as proof per se, but it's interesting. And you have a very responsible journalist digging into this, and this is back in the 80s, using unconventional technologies, as he put it. Um, you know, he had one contact who basically said, look, what we have out there is better than Star Trek, Star Wars, or anything you can see in the movies. Uh, every time Goodall would ask these people to expand on what they had just said, and they would always say, nope, that's all I'm going to give you. Um, but these were very, very compelling accounts uh, we have things in the Nevada desert that would make George Lucas envious. Uh, back in the mid-80s, they were saying this. Better than Star Trek in the mid-1980s. That's more than three decades ago. There's a story of the alien reproduction vehicle. Many of you know this story pretty well. Some of you may not. In 1988, November, uh, right after George uh, Herbert Walker Bush Sr. George Bush Sr. won the uh, election against Michael Dukakis. There was an air show uh, that... Uh, a gentleman named Brad Sorensen attended. He was going to go with his friend, uh, aviation illustrator Mark McCandless, who couldn't go at the last minute. He had some deadline to do. Sorensen goes with a top-level defense official who was a friend of his family and said, I'm going to take you to the real air show. And they go to uh, Lockheed's big hangar facility, described as guarded by guys in M16s. The top-level official says, ooh, OK, don't say a word, and I'll, I'll get you in. They get in, and on one side of this huge uh, this curtain dividing this huge room are <clears throat> losing bids, but still extremely impressive craft for major uh, defense contracts. And on the other side of the curtain were three objects hovering, according to Sorensen. 
And uh, as he described it uh, to other investigators over the years, he said, I was like wide awake uh, examining these things very carefully. They were not suspended by anything. There were no cables. They were just hovering. There was a four-star general at a podium just like this talking about these as alien reproduction vehicles in November of 1988, stating that they had traversed the solar system. Sorensen looked at them as they said they looked like they'd been run around through their paces. They uh, looked like they'd been you know, traveling quite a bit, actually, and um, stated that, uh, what was it? So they, oh, yeah, so they, the general said that they ran on the vacuum. So this is shortly, a year before the first uh, scientific paper on zero-point energy was published by uh, Dr. Hal Putoff, so also known as the vacuum. So do these things, did they run on the vacuum? Well, maybe. Um, that's 1988. And, you know, we've got very good evidence from journalists like George Knapp and people like Linda Moulton Howe, who's here, and uh, a lot of other folks who have talked with um, individuals who've had experiences in Groom Lake and uh, areas related to it. Uh, actually, I say here, George Knapp developed contacts with more than a dozen Area 51 insiders, the number is more like two dozen, who have corroborated uh, various elements of what Bob Lazar had stated back in 1989-1990. Uh, that is, that uh, there were alien disks being tested. And all of Knapp's people just uh, bailed out at the last minute before they went public. They were not willing to speak publicly. But, um, but these are real people. So there's a great deal of uh, smoke, and uh, let's just say, I think, indicative of fire. And then there's the famous video of what's called the Nellis UFO from November 94. This was leaked to the TV show Hard Copy. It's certainly a legitimate video. It's been analyzed by a number of analysts um, because it provides, uh, there's data uh, on that video that can be studied and give you the altitude and azimuth and speed that this thing is going at. It uh, did some extraordinary maneuvers, for sure. Uh, making right angle turns at 140 miles per hour, in, uh, going as slow as 15, 20 miles per hour and as fast as 500, very, very rapidly. Um, you hear uh, uh, people in the Nellis uh, testing area wondering, what is that? They, is that a helicopter? It's not a helicopter. What is it? So uh, it's presumably something that we were making 20, uh, almost 25 years ago, and it's still not officially out there. You got Gary McKinnon and his evidence. Um, really gotten to chat with Gary uh, lately, and he's an extraordinary, a great guy. And of course, Gary McKinnon was uh, wanted for extradition by the US government for a full decade because he um, was looking for evidence of a UFO cover-up in the 90s and the early 2000s and got into the US Space Command site back in uh, 2000 and found a list of officers' names, what were called non-terrestrial officers, uh, a program known as uh, Operation so Program uh, Operation Solar Warden, uh, which seemed like a secret space program to him, and it does to me too. Um, he was arrested in 02 and lived uh, in danger of extradition for the longest time. The US really tried to destroy his life, and, and um, Gary was able to uh, get out of that. The British government finally, the UK government, began to come to his defense a number of years ago. Uh, Oh, yes, I included this little statement. This is a quote from Ronald Reagan's diary from the mid-'80s, and some of you know about this. He just writes, lunch with five top space scientists. It was fascinating. I learned that our shuttle capacity is such that we could orbit 300 people. Well, we don't, we've never officially orbited 300 people, President Reagan, so what, where did that capacity go? It's just worth looking into. Um, a lady that I uh, corresponded with for a little while um, is what I would consider a real expert in uh, military drone technology. And, uh, and I say this because she uh, lives um, in the state of Arkansas in the US near a base, military base. She has, uh, I think, generation three or generation two night vision, that gen three night vision, and has been studying uh, what she believes are military drones in her her airspace, I guess you could say, and she's looked at them for quite some time, um, and has, as a result, done many FOIA requests on US military drone technology, and she's got stacks of papers on this. Knows a lot, she's very knowledgeable about it. Uh, her opinion, incidentally, is that yes, there is a genuine 
non-human UFO phenomenon, but her, her sense is that the large, large number of what people think are UFOs are simply uh, advanced drone technology. That's her opinion. Uh, she wrote to me on one occasion, just said there are all kinds of craft up there, military research and development drones, drone triangles, drone triangles, and even a huge rectangular craft that she saw in daylight. She writes, I've seen these craft cloak. I saw one cloak over my house at treetop level, and I tell you it could not be seen at all, and I was only about 50 yards away. I've also seen these drones from less than 30 feet, and there is no movement, vibration, nothing. It looks as though they are glued to the sky. So, um, so what does this all look like? It seems to me that just based on this bare bones preliminary information that I'm giving you here, uh, there's a UFO reality. There's a major effort to conceal that reality. There's a major effort to replicate that UFO technology. And uh, I'm going to now suggest to, or I will suggest, to go off world in some capacity. So uh, let's keep moving on here. Uh, all of this costs money. And uh, it cannot openly come from your tax dollars because it's too much. And also, if it, it openly comes from tax dollars, there goes the secrecy. <clears throat> so by definition, the UFO cover-up has to create an end run around formal legal uh, procedures that are in place uh, that free societies and transparent societies are supposed to have so that you can actually have accountability, financial account accountability. So it requires a black budget. That is, you know, money that's black, you can't see it, right? That's a black budget. And it requires corruption of the system. The UFO cover-up has to uh, function on a corrupt system. It can't function any other way. Uh, so the question is, if it's not all uh, going to function on your tax dollars, which, again, it's too much, even, even within a black budget, I'm going to suggest, um, how do you get the money? Well, that's a question for creative accountants. Uh, you know, this is why my, uh, my, my friend, my colleague, Catherine Austin Fitz, um, I'm very, very fortunate to be able to talk with her anytime. Uh, she's the financial whiz, not me, but she talks a great deal about uh, securities fraud in the um, U.S. financial system, uh, narcotics trafficking, which is, uh, you know, sanctioned by uh, the CIA and other intelligence agencies. Of course, if anyone who's looked into this, this is uh, openly known. So there's a lot of money in those various industries that are all off the books. They're unaccountable, unvouchered funds, and it makes it very, very nice to have access to those if you want to pay for really expensive programs and you don't want to have to explain it to Congress. So let me, I'm going to switch gears a little bit now. I said earlier that the UFO phenomenon inserted itself into our culture at a, at a bad time. It's kind of true, kind of not true. I mean, <clears throat> there's a very overwhelming likelihood, frankly, that they, whoever they are, they've been here a long, long, long time. But when I say inserted ourselves into our culture, I mean <clears throat> in an open way that we're aware of that I, I think that timing is bad. So <clears throat> I feel I created this little, this little graphic here. So look at two paths converging. There's the, the path of human civilization, and then there's this reality, and where, and it converges to say where we're, where we're going. So the UFO phenomenon has amplified, it hasn't created per se, but it has amplified our black budget world, um, the weaponizing of technologies, um, it has absolutely demanded the concealing of breakthroughs, so, and I've talked about this so many times. Uh, essentially, if you've got a classified system in place that's responsible for doing the science of this technology, at some point they're going to make a variety of scientific and technological breakthroughs. And some of those breakthroughs can be segued into money-making opportunities to society, absolutely, and some will not be because they're just too important. Uh, they're too revolutionary, uh, whether it's energy breakthroughs or uh, propulsion breakthroughs, I think are two good ones that have been held back for a long time. Now, they probably can't be held back forever, but they've been held back for a long time as it is, uh, creating what I've often called the breakaway civilization and a secret space program. So that's what the UFO reality has done. Um, and it has created a large infrastructure, a secret infrastructure that is off limits to us, it's off the grid. That's not just off world, I think it's a subterranean infrastructure as well, under, underground, with very, very involved 
um, underground bases and uh, tunnel systems and the like. So uh, this is a graphic I, I created um, a little while ago, and I, I like this, so I want to just uh, keep it for a little while. I feel like we live in a variety of uh, mental worlds. So the center is the brightest. That's the one where all attention is being directed for you to look at. It's the, what I call mass reality. It's, it's uh, the Super Bowl. It's Katy Perry. It's um, you know sporting events and uh, reality TV shows and you know, um, your kind of uh, dumbed down mainstream news, particularly in the US, uh, it's pretty bad. So it's all the things that are, people are just telling you, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at your popular culture. Listen to the awful music that we throw at you and the, you know, really the ridiculous, insultingly bad cultures that are just shoved at us through, through corporations. That's mass reality. And, you know, many people, um, realize that that's kind of low-level consciousness, as it were, and, and so they go to the university, and then they realize, oh my goodness, wow, now I understand how the world is. They go to the academic reality, where they um, realize that, no, we can look at the world in a sophisticated way, and we can become uh, critics of, uh, of U.S. foreign relations. As I, I was part of that reality uh, 30 years ago, thinking, oh yes, I've graduated, and I, I can now see things, because I've read Noam Chomsky and I understand how the world works. And not to di disparage Noam Chomsky, by the way. Uh, I read many of his books years ago, but uh, that's kind of the limit of where uh, alternative uh, academic reality will go. And the reason, by the way, at least speaking from a historian's point of view, is that um, historians, you know, their profession is based on gathering sources that are readily available in archives. And that's what makes historians so valuable. Like they're, you, they don't make things up. They don't give you unverified claims. What makes a historian valuable to us is that they do the hard work of going through archives and documenting the information that they present to you about whatever subject it is. Uh, that's an incredibly valuable thing. The, the liability is that there's this, um, you know, there's one thing that's off limits to them and that's classified documents because it's off limits to everyone. And what I found in my life in that world was that there's this tendency. Historians will say, oh yes, well we know there's classified documents, but then it's as if they forget that these things exist. And so the, all the classified stuff that uh, does go on in that world are really just never discussed. And so that's a reality that goes beyond the academic reality. You know, in other words, uh, this is why historians to my, uh, have always talked against so-called conspiracy theories. It's because the really deep conspiracies actually are off limits to them. Uh, because if it's a good conspiracy, it will be off limits. It will be classified and you're never gonna know about it. If the CIA does their job with a false flag or other kinds of nefarious cover-ups and they do all of those things, then getting proof on these things is gonna be very difficult and so, uh, you see that this is the limit. So, but with it beyond the academic reality is classified reality, where there are people in that world who know full well that there are all kinds of really, truly uh, off-limit nefarious types of activity, activities that go on. But even within that world, a very small percentage of those are actually uh, aware of this reality that we're talking about. I call it the breakaway reality. The reality of um, those individuals who are actively dealing with this phenomenon in a let's say a professional capacity. Uh, many of us in the room here uh, have been delving into understanding that reality as well, as well as the, the last, the darkest, the hardest to pierce uh, ring, which is the reality of these other beings. Now, that's always gonna be the hardest for us to understand. I don't think they think the way we do. I think they're very, very different, and uh, we may never really have a true understanding or appreciation of what they are about. So there's a lot of different layers of reality, mental realities. And so with that in mind, I want to talk about our, that, our all too human hierarchy. That's JP Morgan. Uh, I'm going to suggest something to you, which is that uh, the existence of a middle class in Western civilization is a historical anomaly and doesn't have to exist indefinitely. And, and it, might be, it might be slated for removal uh, within the lifetimes of many of us here. Um, the fact is that those people at the top of our 
human hierarchy have always wanted to live like gods, always. And they've always thought of themselves like that. This is the truth. Whether um, you're talking about medieval kings or Chinese emperors or any other place, any other type of uh, you know, Egyptian pharaohs, uh, the people at the top of our hierarchy have always seen themselves as way, way above the unwashed, ignorant rabble that they have ruled over. It's always been that way. It's never been different. Um, but the, the thing is, for about a 200-year period, a little bit more than that, I would say, uh, from the middle of the 18th century, the beginning of the real industrial revolution, right, till, we'll say, the later part of the 20th century, and we can argue about what the cutoff is for that, uh, those elites recognized something, which was that it was in their interest, as well as uh, the little people's interest, to have a thriving middle class because what they realized is that that middle class, that industrial class, created a tremendous amount of wealth for them and made their lives better uh, by orders of magnitude. And so it was absolutely in their interest to promote, to a certain extent, the creation of a kind of more egalitarian society where you would allow greater uh, freedom of action for a larger number of people. Whereas in the past, those same people would not have been permitted to, uh, and were not permitted, uh, the kind of uh, economic leeway that we now saw in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. So it was a really uh, unusual period. And, and I think people during that period of time had a different interpretation of it. They said, well, this is the normal progress of human civilization. You know, the ever, grading, ever greater uh, in expansion of freedom. And this is the normal uh, progress, but I'm going to submit to you that that actually may not really be the case. That this uh, middle class, this create, this unbelievable creation of wealth by all of these different people who were allowed to have what is true freedom of enterprise, the uh, freedom to create their own destiny, um, to create better products, to invent new products. That's a historical anomaly that was allowed. Uh, because it was so beneficial to those individuals at the very top of our hierarchy. And um, my suggestion is that it may very well be their decision that they're no longer going to need those of us who have been part of that middle class and that creation of wealth, that intellectual ferment that came about as a result of so many people allowing, being allowed to be geniuses in their field and creating, creating, creating all these new things. Why are we no longer going to be necessary, possibly? Well, part of it is just the way that our technology is now moving. You know, uh, there's Moore's law, the you know the doubling of uh, of capacity of leading edge computers every 18 to 24 months. That has held uh, for over 50 years. It's still going. Uh, the development of a strong artificial intelligence. You know, a, a future not long from now in which your computer very likely will be able to tell you that it's a conscious sentient being. And you, you may very well be likely to accept those claims, even if you know at some level its consciousness is not the same as yours. It's going to seem like it, except it'll seem a lot more intelligent than any of us. Uh, then there's quantum computing and molecular computing. I should include that up on here. Uh, these are new types of well, quantum computing we've all heard of, I think, um, that are revolutionary forms of computational um, capabilities. And then there's nanotech and robotics and next generation 3D printing and organic 3D printing, for goodness sake. And there's CRISPR technology, that is gene editing, uh, brain mapping. You, you start thinking about how these, these sciences are going to be interacting with each other. I, I think it's an impossibility for us to foresee all of the different ways that they're going to be able to enhance each other. But I think you can get the idea that uh, it's going to be in ways that are very, very significant indeed. And on top of that, implants for greater abilities. These things are already coming online now. Uh, population profiling, think minority report. That's already happening. Um, everyone knows this now. So, you know, your Google searches um, are being tracked. Your, uh, your inbox is being profiled. And, uh, you know, all of that data is going somewhere. And it's not going to you, by the way. It's going to someone who's not you. And it seems to me that they will 
probably already have a greater ability to know certain elements about your personality than you know because they'll have the data available to be able to uh, map you right psychologically I'm sure that that capability exists very very significantly right now uh, on top of things like facial and voice recognition there's really nowhere to run anymore so if you if you think that you're going to just go under the under the you know radar from um, Big Brother, it's not happening anymore. Like any phone call you make, the capability, if, if not now, then right around the corner to have your voice imprint recognized digitally, it already exists. So the only question is how widespread is the capability to track you? That's, and it's really just a matter of time before uh, next generation AI algorithms will be able to just do all this job without any human intervention whatsoever. They'll just be able to do it. Uh, total 24-7, 365 comprehensive surveillance for the rest of all time, including um, mind-reading technology, so your mind won't be secure either. Uh, these, there are all kinds of news articles discuss, discussing this already. The latest ones that I read uh, still require you know, your brain to be hooked up with, uh, electron, with uh, uh, le electrodes. And uh, there are algorithms, because they're already able to map the brain sufficiently so they, they can know like what parts of your brains light up and when they know that they can get better and better estimates of what you're actually thinking and that's only the beginning so at some point we have to assume they're going to be able to do this without hooking your brain up electronically and they'll just be able to do it remotely um, think about all those airport scanners you know there's the there's the program going on right now and i'm not this has been outed already um, to um, study human DNA uh, of experiencers, you know, and, uh, and so that could be a good thing or a bad thing because it could be a good thing because after all, if you've had a, uh, the idea is that your DNA, um, you know, th th studies like epigenetics will tell us that uh, every experience you have in your life leaves uh, an impression on your genetic profile. It, it leaves a mark, a marker. And so the idea is if you've had an experience with the UFO phenomenon or non-human beings, that this would leave a marker on you. And then the idea would be, is there a way to um, identify that and thereby to identify all of you and us who have had such experiences? This is, seems outlandish to some, but it's not outlandish and it's actively being studied right now. Um, there's a lot to say about this, actually, and uh, I don't know how much it's really relevant for me to get into here, but the kinds of capabilities to read people are just going off the charts. And my main point here, and I'll just put one of my last little bullet item, ultra-fast, ultra-intelligent machines, robots, and virtual entities, so, you know, virtual assistants. Um, people's jobs are just no longer really going to be necessary. Uh, they talk about the robo-apocalypse robo -apocalypse coming, and it's not the Terminator coming to kill you, it's the Terminator coming to take your job away. And we really have to ask ourselves, what are people going to do to survive in another 20 years? This is why. Uh, a lot of the AI people are talking about, you know, we need to have a universal basic income so people can survive. And I can understand that because it's a, it's a valid question. What will people do? Of course, you can just keep in mind, universal basic income means you will never, ever have independence ever again for the rest of your life because, you know, you're going to be dependent on a state authority for your very uh, livelihood, uh, for your very life. This is the world we're going into. So what it means is that all of the physical and intellectual labor that for the last 200 plus years that has gone into creating a world of unbelievable wealth, which is the world that we are living in, compared to the world of two centuries ago. I mean, there's no comparison. All right, all of that intellectual fertility and creativity and drive that was done by human beings uh, we have to ask ourselves, is that really going to be necessary from the point of view of those elites who want to live like gods? And I think the answer is no. They don't need people like that anymore. 
They don't need it. They're already believing that they can become immortal. Like right now, they believe this. And you get, you get, you know, establishment news articles that come out every so often talking about immortality is around the corner. Uh, you know, manipulate those telomeres and prevent, it, prevent aging from happening. And Well, that's great um, if you're someone who can afford it um, because I can guarantee you that type of technology and the gene editing and, you know, having better and smarter kids with better immune systems, uh, stronger physically, stronger intellectually, um, you pay up. <laughs> So it's not going to be available for everyone. I seriously doubt that. And uh, so what it means is that we're moving toward a biologically based caste system. That's what I will, I would assume that that's what we're moving toward. And if that's the case, uh, I think we can also assume that next generation AI, next generation artificial intelligences and computing technology uh, will take a huge load of intellectual energy off of what was previously done by people. And so it will no longer be necessary to uh, have a thriving middle class. That's my guess. I think that's what we're moving toward. So, um, you know, the real goal for those elites has always been genetic superiority, unimaginable luxury, and immortality. And that's, that's what they're going to be moving toward. And I think uh, there's no obstacles in their way at this point. It's all moving. So um, our world, and I know I'm here in Canada, which is the most polite nation on earth. Um, I, live, I live right across the lake. I'm in upstate New York in Rochester. I love Canada. I married a Canadian lady who's here. And uh, there's Tracy. So um, I'm an honorary hoser, and I'm totally into it. I love it. <laughs> Love it. But the, so for me to say what I'm about to say in Canada, though, is, um, is jarring because Canada is not the kind of society that we like to think of as having a four class system. And it's not as obvious and open in Canada as elsewhere, as so I will certainly acknowledge that. But nonetheless, in our world, we've, we've got undeniably a four class system. It's worldwide. And it's very, very simple. All you have to do is look at the distribution of wealth in any society, and Canada's is really no different uh, fundamentally from that of the United States or most of Europe or Asia for that matter. There's always differences in degree, but you've got the owner class at the very top. That is those people who have the you know, vastly, vastly greatest amount of, of money at their disposal. And really, it's always a shocking statistic. Um, and then just below them are people who have a lot of money, a great deal of money, and a great stake in the system, but they are clearly working for those people at the top, and I call them the managers. They make sure everything... It's like if you have a room with a, a, a total amount of money of $100, 100 people. So if it were a utopian communist society, everyone would have $1. You know, hopefully sing songs and really feel good about things. I doubt it. I don't think that would work very well, but that would be the total egalitarian society. But in our little room here, one person owns close to 50 of those dollars. One guy owns 50 of the available dollars, about half all the wealth. And then the next person owns another 10 or 11 of those dollars. That's actually the breakdown of wealth in our society, and that's the owner and manager class. And they have to keep what I call the worker bees in line. Those are the people who actually do the work and keep society going. They have, uh, George Carlin put it best, you know, in one of his later monologues. He says they have, they're smart enough to do the paperwork and uh, operate the machinery to keep it going, but they're stupid enough to keep paying attention to the system and doing what they're told. Uh, it's really true. The education system is designed to keep those worker bees in motion and, and have them um, keep the society going. And then at the bottom, and in my country, that's a, this is a growing, growing number for sure, are the expendables. People who have... Uh, really no skills, no work skills to, that's going to keep them uh, employed for any extended period of time. Reading and writing skills are limited. Knowledge of things in general is very limited. Uh, and that's worldwide. So um, that's, our, that's our society. And what we're going to see is a diminution of those worker bees increasingly. That's what I think is happening. You know, what's going to happen when Google uh, Drive, uh, not Google Drive, what is it, Google uh, uh, Transportation, uh, systems uh, start to replace the largest uh, bit of employment for most men, uh, and that's driving jobs. 
uh, what are these guys, they're not, they're not all university educated. You know, they, they drive, this is their job. And increasingly, those jobs are just going away. You know, for over 20 years I worked, uh, in addition to doing books on UFOs, I worked privately to write professional resumes for job seekers. Uh, I worked with thousands of people. Really got to know what they did for their living. And um, most people, they're, they've got a very, very simple goal. They've got a job, they want to keep their job. And I dealt with a lot of job seekers who were, their jobs were just outsourced to other nations. And it's a really hard thing. It's a crisis for many people to see them lose the job that they've had for 30 years and not know what to do when they're 55 years old. And, um, but you're going to see this increasingly and exponentially faster and faster as we, move, as we lurch into the future. So what we're really seeing is it's a new system of royalty that is developing on this planet and in all but name. Uh, they're never going to call it that way. Uh, and it involves a breakaway, not just civilization, but a breakaway financial structure that is um, where these individuals are really not bound by rule of law with their financial willings and dealings. Uh, what we're definitely seeing is the end of nations increasingly. This is absolutely a critical goal. Um, and if you're one of those people at the very top, it makes sense. You want to have that. You don't want to, if you own a transnational corporation, you need your, everything to move along very smoothly across nations and you don't want uh, active borders. You want things to move uh, easily for you. Uh, and there's a certain logic to this. And let me just take a minute out and talk about globalization and the new world order. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that a new world order has to be evil. It doesn't have to be. Uh, you know, a lot of people forget that the idea of this originated after the bloodshed, mayhem, meat grinder, horrific nature of World War I, which destroyed uh, an entire generation of European men they were just, um, that's why they called them the lost generation. And it was such a traumatic thing that out of that, <clears throat> many individuals said, war, we just can't have war anymore. It's absolutely immoral. We must not have it. We have to have rule of law internationally. And we need to get rid of this uh, primitive nationalism that's causing nations to create enemies out of each other. And so it's an easy concept to understand and to support. The, the issue is not is, uh, is globalization a good or a bad thing, because I, I suspect it's an inevitability based on our technological path. But the question is, how is it going to look? Um, and what, by that, what I mean is, is it going to look like something that approaches uh, rule by the people or not? And what I think is it's turning out to be the latter. So you've got a globalization that's dominated financially by a very, very small group of people and where uh, the decision-making capabilities of individuals and in their nations is increasingly is being taken away from them. So that's the kind of globalization that I think a lot of folks are not happy with, myself included. Um, we are moving toward a world of total financial control over people, total bureaucratic control over people, total legal control over people, total intellectual control over people. You see it more and more every day uh, and to create a new global paradigm. And this is not a world based on freedom. It's a world based on rigid control whether you're in the West, what we think of as a country with Western tradition or not, doesn't make any difference. That's the world we're moving into. Um, I wondered if I should keep this slide or not. I created this for another lecture. I do like it. This is um, one way that I think uh, to visualize how the uh, world's secrecy operates. So in other words, there's no nations anymore. They're kind of a myth. Uh, they do sort of exist, but they sort of do not exist. And what we have is a trans national, global, financial, and political elite that works through, in many ways, through the United States to um, strong arm the rest of the world. So uh, U.S. black budget agencies, the um, surveillance of the entire world, the NSA, the NRO, that's the National Reconnaissance Office, uh, U.S. military, all of these are used as weapons by a global elite to get the rest of the world online with, uh, with the agenda. They call them partnerships with other nations. Um, so now I want to talk about methods of control. And by the way, I'm going to come back to uh, this uh, phenomenon we call UFOs. So let me just check my time. I've got about 45 minutes. Good. So there are different ways that we, the people, are controlled by this encroaching system. One is financial. Uh, I, I remember, uh, I, you know, I was too young to appreciate the 60s. Some of you aren't. 
Um, I was a kid. Talked to a lot of people who went through that. And um, so in my uh, town where I live, in Rochester, New York, I remember chatting with a guy who he, um, he said, you know, it was really easy in the mid-60s to quit high school, go to California, take acid for like three years, and then come back and get hired by Eastman Kodak for a job that would pay my mortgage. Like, that happened. And it happened many times. Because back then, the United States and Western economies were going full speed ahead. And it was great. Like, you could actually afford to drop out of the system for a while, hang out at a commune, grow your hair long, and then you come back. And uh, did I drop something here? What is this? Um, and then come back and get a job and you know, have a life. And it would pay your bills. Like, well, those days are gone. That doesn't exist anymore. Uh, absolutely doesn't exist. So there, those, you don't see that because it can't happen. The, I mean, in Europe, you've got structural unemployment that is so frightening. Uh, young people uh, unable to leave their homes. And you see it in North America as well. It's happening more and more and more. So economic insecurity is very, very, very big. And then you've got all the offshoring of jobs. You've got automation causing a lot of this. You've got uh, the bureaucratization of our entire global system, it seems to me. Um, and I'm not saying that we, you don't want to have laws to ensure public safety for different products, but it can get to a point where it really does impede the creation of new industries and new jobs, uh, which is really the only kind of real freedom that we're gonna have, to be perfectly candid about it, is the freedom to create your own economic future. And that's becoming increasingly difficult for people to do. Um, intellectual property laws are becoming, uh, in the sense of um, a global intellectual property system that is being put into place. Uh, we remember when um, uh, the TPP was a big issue, and uh, this was the first thing, actually, that uh, Donald Trump did as president, was to just pull the U.S. out of that Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, I was very glad, actually, that that was the case. Of course, TPP is, is still in effect among those other nations. Uh, is Canada in TPP? Yeah. It is, right? Yeah, I thought so. Um, and you can make an argument for it, and you can definitely make arguments against it. So one of the things against it is that it, it really uh, is created by major corporations exclusively for their benefit, that's true. One of the things is uh, the creation of intellectual property rights uh, internationally. So let's just say, think, think about the UFO subject for a minute. If some brilliant mind in Vietnam, because they're a signatory to PP, TPP, uh, if they come up with a, um, a free energy device that uh, can fit in your hand and allow you to go off the grid, I would argue that it would be very likely that they would run into classified patents that are held by the national security deep state and that that person would be thereby prevented from uh, from you know, making that patent and having, and having the product. Um, so th this whole system's going into place internationally increasingly. That's, it, there's no escaping, no escaping from it. Um, everything is done in the, nation, in the name of safety and security. Uh, all of these laws, all of these uh, excessive you know, monitoring of our lives. Uh, but all of these favor large corporations. Certainly, uh, in, I live in, in New York State and it's very difficult to start a business in New York State. It's very tough. Um, so anyway, that's financial control. Then another method of control is surveillance. And this is an obvious one. They track you through your computer, every website you go to. It's very tough to escape that these days uh, through your email. And then there's, of course, uh, every increasingly many street corners, video and uh, increasingly audio surveillance. There's monitoring of you on social media, your Facebook page. Uh, this is really, really a huge thing now. Uh, job seekers have to be very careful, right? What they have on their social media feed because prospective employers and current employers will sometimes monitor that very carefully. So again, it's another level of inhibition over the population, another le level of control over the population. All these new uh, apps on our phones to make you more connected. Uh, yeah, that's true. They'll make you more connected and they'll also it's another 
uh, rope around you to keep you uh, controlled. So, uh, for example, the cell phone apps that will monitor your, your physiology. Um, data conceivably can be going somewhere. Now, there may be laws in place to prevent that, but the question is, are all of those laws actually followed? And is there, are we really sure that no one is getting your financial information on your, your banking app, for instance? Well, maybe. Maybe for now. I don't know. Um, you know, we already had the example less than a decade ago of the, the haircut that was given to the nation, uh, to the uh, island of Crete, by uh, government going into people's private bank accounts and taking their money out. Um, as a way to pay for, pay for the debt of, uh, of that region. So uh, the cell phone apps to monitor your location, uh, all of these are ways of keeping us more and more under surveillance. And there are laws in place to protect us from some of these things now. But again, it's how long and how effective are they really is really the question to ask. And I don't have the answer to that, but uh, I think it would be foolish to assume that even now, all of these laws are actually meticulously followed. I just I seriously doubt it. Um, so, you know, surveillance is, is everywhere, and it, there's no escaping it anymore. And uh, I wrote here, ultimately, microchips. And I actually wonder if maybe that's just old school. I have a feeling that uh, there's, there's a solution that's going to be much more sophisticated and slick uh, than microchips. So uh, I don't know what it will be. Maybe an aerosol mist. Or maybe it will be, you know, your cell phone basically is your chip right now. Um, so we're being monitored and surveilled uh, at all times. Uh, and then there's fear. Fear is a very, very major way to control us. Um, you know, I'm doing a, a significant study of uh, false flags. I'm still getting my book done on that. And uh, I argue that we live in an era of false flags. That is a false flag. That is a horrible thing done by a, an, an agency, a government often that um, is traumatizing to one extent or another, fear-inducing, uh, that is then blamed on another party, another group, as a way to justify actions that could not otherwise be justified. And uh, it's part of the world that we live in. It's a world in which we are ruled by fear increasingly. Um, in the US, Canada too, really, uh, not, not really radically different at all. Uh, News is very, very tightly controlled. Uh, it's the fact of creation, creating reality by omission, I think, is the most significant way to do it. So things just are left out, um, and other things are inserted in. And there's always some demon that you've got to worry about. You know, a decade ago it was uh, Saddam Hussein. Hell, 20 years ago it was Saddam Hussein. Then 10 years ago it was Saddam Hussein again. And then it was Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, and now it's Putin. And who's going to be next? Well, it'll be whoever, whoever is the guy who uh, stands in the way of the hegemony of a very, very small financial elite. That's the next enemy that you're supposed to be afraid of. Uh, the whole point is to create insecurity among us and dependency. There was a, a program done in Europe during the Cold War known as Gl Operation Gladio. It's a false, series of false flags done by uh, CIA connected, NATO intelligence connected uh, individuals who um, would blow up train stations, kill lots of people and blame it on communists or blame it on terrorists. And Gladio was outed in the early 1990s in Italy. There, there were versions of Gladio that were in all the European countries. The Italian version was called Gladio. And that was outed and one of the uh, operatives who was arrested and in prison was named uh, um, Vincenzo Vinciguerra, I believe his name was, and he said, look, the whole point of what we did was um, to instill fear in the population, have them go running to the state for protection. It was very, very simple. That's what it was all about. And that's the world that we're in right now, fear. Another method of control is to poison our bodies. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced that this is a significant, um, it's uh, an attack on humanity, to be honest with you, through toxic foods, through the pharmaceutical drugs that uh, especially young people are having this foisted upon them. And look, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm a parent. I have two uh, young adult children. I understand the difficult decisions that every parent has to make in raising their child. Um, so I'm not getting after your case. If, um, but I, I have to say 
uh, the pharmaceutical industry is like a predator and it is going after these young people. Their brains aren't done developing yet. And you know, by throwing these chemicals at them, it's a, it's a crime. It's a crime. Yeah. And it's, thank you. It's, um, yeah, that, that was kind of you. Uh, it's, it's criminal, though, because uh, you've got these enormous companies making billions of dollars. And, and I know the argument. It helps some people. Yes, it does, but not everyone's the same. Everyone's body chemistry is different. And uh, it's not good for everyone, and yet you've got this one-size-fits-all. And just give them this drug, give them that drug, give them this drug. And, and it, uh, it, dulls, it dulls these people. And you're, you're, not, you're not done developing um, neurologically. Your brain's not done until your late 20s. So by giving these young people these drugs, I mean, who knows what, what it's doing to them. Um, and then you've got, uh, we, was just, we were tracing our way in Australia recently and, and chatting with a, a man who really, I think, is an expert in electronic frequencies and the dangers of 5G technologies that are right, coming right at us. Better be careful. Uh, this is, I don't think this is going to be very good for us at all. Uh, but there's a wide array of electronic frequencies that we are all exposed to every day. They're not natural. It's not how we're designed to live. And I don't pretend that I know the full uh, biological impacts of what we're dealing with, but I, it cannot be good. Um, and then the illegal drugs. You got the legal drugs and you got the illegal drugs. And I know I mentioned uh, Catherine Austin Fitz a little earlier in this talk. I remember, I'll never forget a conversation I had with her almost 15 years ago about drugs about illegal drugs. It was shortly after I became aware of her work. And I remember uh, I get under these little rants uh, all the time. And I was ranting with her on the phone. I said, they should just legalize all the drugs. Damn it. I'm tired of criminalizing everything. She said, well, that's great. You'll just see a banking failure in, uh, <laughs> across the, the globe if that happens. And I said, OK, well, why? She said, well, it's very simple. You know, uh, the narcotics industry is so huge. And these banks are making massive amounts of money off of illegally laundering the money. Someone's got to, someone, you know, if you've got $100 million that you need laundered, because you can't just take your, you know, you saw Breaking Bad, right? He's got those fat stacks of cash. You have to find a way to launder the money. And it's the reality. So banks and financial institutions are competing for that business, and they get a cut of that. So, and it's a big part of uh, how the global system works. And then by making those narcotics uh, legal, excuse me, uh, that laundering system goes away. And there's going to be win winners, but there's going to be losers from uh, making those drugs legal. Uh, but the other thing about illegal narcotics, of course, is that it stupefies populations. I mean, when you've got, you know, I talked about the expendable class, those people at the very bottom of the hierarchy. I mean, what, what is the future for someone who really can't read, can't really do math? Uh, doesn't have a positive working ethic and attitude, and they're just, it's not going to happen. So you might as well just let them get on, on heroin or other opiates or other drugs and just let them live their life out quietly so they're not bothering anyone. And I believe that that's the solution that has been made. It's a horrible solution. It destroys, it's, a, it's the most destructive solution imaginable. We have human beings who are at the bottom of this hierarchy, and that number is growing. It's not, I don't think it's getting smaller. I think it's going to grow because there's going to be nothing for these people to do with their lives. All right? uh, the, 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 the capitalist system that we've had up till now has been a great creator of wealth. I'm not, a, I'm not an attacker of capitalism, not at all. I think uh, it's been very unfairly attacked, actually. But um, I think we're moving into a new phase of our civilization in which, um, you know, as I say, the, the people may not be considered necessary anymore. So all the chemicals that we're ingesting, all of these things are poisoning our bodies. And the fact is, it's really going to be tough for us to, to be intellectually on our game and with the energy <clears throat> necessary to confront this system if our bodies are unhealthy. And that's just the reality. And that's what's happening to so many of us. Uh, another method of control is to, um, let's say, erase our identities. And um, you know, some people like what I'm going to say here, and some people don't. And 
And uh, I, I didn't, I'm not right wing or left wing. I don't know what I am. I mean, I believe in freedom for people and I believe in your ability to make your own decisions. So whatever that makes me. But I do think that there's a great danger that has been spreading for uh, quite some time, more than 10 years, really 20 plus years, uh, what we might call political correctness movement and identity politics movement. And, um, and more broadly, uh, a, a very widespread attack, attack on classical Western civilization. I think it's very dangerous. It's a very dangerous road to go down. Uh, it's not that Europeans didn't commit crimes when they came to the New World. Of course they did. Uh, crimes are committed by every nation on this planet, and the Europeans were no different, and some of the crimes they committed were awful. But Western civilization also bequeathed us an ideology of freedom. And that ideology didn't always meet with the reality, but it nevertheless informed our world, and it's this, one of the most single important gifts that uh, Western civilization has given to us, this idea of what we might call classical liberalism, the idea that you are responsible for yourself. You're, you're not responsible for your forebears. You're not responsible for your father or your mother. You're not responsible for your people, however they are defined. You are responsible for yourself. And it's a very, very important, very important concept. And it's, it's really being eroded. And, and the reason I think it's important to discuss in this context is that in a society where global civilization is consciously being remade, see, it has to be remade to, to create a much more docile public. It's the whole point. When there's no opportunity for people, you've got to create a culture that, that encourages docility. And, uh, and, and the best way to do that is by t removing this idea that people are responsible for themselves. And I think this is what we're seeing. So, um, you know, uh, erasing our identities, erasing uh, the heritage of Western civilization, I guess is what I'm saying here. And I think it's, it is dangerous. Uh, aside from the fact that Google and Facebook now are openly uh, controlling uh, search results uh, against things that they consider um, bad for you. And they actively do this, and they're very open about it. And I don't know about you, but I have noticed, like, my Google searches are harder and harder to do. Have you, has anyone else noticed this? Yeah. Like, yeah, it's very, very difficult. Like, I, uh, even five years ago, three years ago, I would do a Google search, and uh, I, I think I'm a master of Google searches. I know how to get what I'm looking for really well. It's harder for me. It's harder. I've got to be a lot more uh, creative because I'm getting more and more uh, corporate uh, search results coming up all the time. Total mainstream, uh, pre pre masticated, pre chewed news just for me, and it's really annoying. Uh -huh. So this is how our identities are being controlled increasingly. Um, and another method of control is to poison your soul. And I'm not I'm not joking here. So I think what's happened is um, again this we're, we're looking at the creation of a global culture that is fundamentally unhealthy and fundamentally um, anti human. And there's Lady Gaga doing her uh, whatever it is she's doing there. Um, and she's not the only one. This is widespread. So it's a debasement of our popular culture. And I'm not saying that popular culture 100 years ago was this wonderful thing. I mean, every culture has got its problems. 50 years ago, lots of problems. Um, but I often wonder, you know, what would people of the past think if they were to experience our popular culture today? I, th I think there would be this horror I mean, an absolute horror in many ways at what we've become, but particularly the, the hyper-sexualization. Uh, it's just out of control. And the, the trivial nature of so much of our pop culture is just out of control. And then here's an interesting thing, the, the fact that it's all fantasy-based, like all the Hollywood movies, everything is fantasy-based. Um, all the superhero movies, again and again. And there's a reason that Hollywood does it, from what I'm told, they're trying to hit the foreign markets, particularly now the Chinese market's really huge, and the idea is to have simplified uh, scripts and not too, not too complex, because they've got to translate these to all these other cultures, so okay, I understand that, but the fact is that the, it's fantasy, 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 and something not right about that. So the, and then, you know, think in the future with gaming and now virtual reality, VR. Uh, there's a whole new generation coming up, and I just have to wonder, um, you know, how much, how much time do I have? 
Um, how much are these young people now going to be living in a completely uh, fantasy-driven reality, totally disconnected from actual reality? Because the fact is, when you got no hope, you got no future, you got nothing to look forward to, you might as well just zone out in your little whatever fantasy world you got on virtual reality. So it's becoming more and more an attractive op option. You know, in a society where there's actual opportunity for people, there's the motivation for them to straighten up and fly right. There's a motivation for them to get an education, motivation for them to have an actual work ethic, motivation to do all the things that most of us grew up thinking were normal. But that's all now changing. So we're seeing slowly but surely the imposition of a completely different type of culture. And it is a debased culture that uh, I personally am convinced is designed to remove us from our higher selves. So, uh, and actually I basically just said everything here. Um, transform culture and society to create a docile and confused population. I didn't mention that before, but yes, confused. I mean, think about how impossible it really is to understand the world by following establishment news. And I'm not even just your TV news, that's bad enough, but even like the New York Times uh, or the Washington Post or you know, any of the Canadian newspapers, I don't think it's really possible. I think it's actually impossible uh, using those sources alone to formulate a coherent vision of what is going on in this world. It's, it's not possible anymore. They don't, they don't provide that insight. So, uh, and when you're confused, it's, well, you can't defend yourself and you can't defend your interests because you don't really understand what's going on in the world. So, and you're docile to boot. So, and then the weaponized people. As people still need to feel like they're fighting for something that's, that's good, right? I mean, people need, we all need to have self-respect. So people are weaponized by a kind of global media agenda now. It's really that simple. Uh, against whatever the new enemy is, uh, whether racists or sexists, uh, Trump or Putin, take your pick. And it's not like those are good things. I mean, racists, we, we don't support racism. We don't support sexism. I understand that. I don't support them, and neither do you. Uh, but what I am saying is by whipping up a public uh, agenda toward these types of iconic things to attack when actually the real issues are being left far, far behind and ignored, then I have to ask myself, what's going on here? Uh, desire for privacy is going away. Desire for economic freedom is just all that's being removed. Uh, privacy, you have a whole new generation of, of young people now. Um, what's the percentage of the population, I wonder, born after 9-11? I don't know, it's uh, getting closer and closer to 50%. It's probably in the, more than a third of uh, the U.S. and Canadian populations are comprised of people born after 2001. Probably, it's getting close to 30%, if, if not past it. So there's a huge number of people now in our world that have grown up, uh, they don't know the before times, all right? They don't know that there was a time when people actually truly believed that they had rights and they had freedoms. Um, and I, I, I'm not saying this facetiously, I mean, for real. I think, so the new generation of people are growing up knowing that their lives are public, everything's on Facebook, everything's on Instagram, and they, and they do it to themselves, like willingly, openly, because the culture's changed. It's like, who needs privacy? Uh, the culture is being changed. So um, I created this little vision, this graph. Um, I think of us as uh, creatures who have basic needs and we have higher needs. And it's the basic needs, you know, we need food and we need friends and love and sex and family and money and our career. Um, we need those to have a fulfilled life. And, and then there's higher needs as well. And I have love on the higher needs as well. I've, to me, love is both, it's basic and higher. But our higher needs would be learning and ideas and creativity and spirituality and understanding of the world we live in and love. These are our higher needs. And I feel, anyway, to be a, a fully integrated person, uh, we need all of those things to be, um, to be who we are. And our, the higher needs, that's, that's the part of us that's what makes us really special, right? Um, and it's what brings us above the base level. And what I will uh, suggest to you is that our, our new culture that's being created is it, it erasing, do I have a little marker here? It erases this, that's the higher needs, and it, it promotes this and you know, blazons the basic needs again and again. 
I didn't make a very good job at that graphic, but you can get the idea of what I mean. The culture that we live in promotes the basic low-level needs and at the exclusion of higher needs. Uh, that is my opinion. And that's, that, there's a reason for that. Now let me get back to uh, money. So, um, so you may have heard uh, the news article of the last, last couple of months, actually. It's gotten reported um, in a few places and not reported in many, many, many other places. Um, that the Pentagon and uh, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, lost, misplaced, unauthorized spending of $21 trillion. And you're wondering, wondering well, what, how, how is that possible? So um, this is something that uh, came about through the research of uh, Catherine Austin Fitz, again, who I've mentioned a few times. Catherine was not only assistant secretary of HUD back in the days of George Bush Sr., so she was number two at HUD, uh, but she's a financial expert, um, really superb, and has been uh, probably more than anyone else that I know the foremost expert on what we might call black budget economics. Uh, she's written a lot about it, and she's talked for years about how trillions, not billions, but trillions of dollars seem to have gone missing from the U.S. government. And uh, famously, of course, shortly before 9-11, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld uh, talked to um, U.S. Congress about 2.6 and then later amended to $2.3 trillion of undocumented expenditures. He says, if you can believe it, that was his quote, uh, to chuckles in the, uh, in the U.S. Congress. You read the transcript. Uh, and then came 9-11 and that story kind of went away. Um, well, what uh, the story of this 21 trillion came about because uh, Professor Mark Skidmore, uh, who's an economist in, uh, I think, at the University of Michigan, uh, heard, came across one of Catherine's statements that trillions of dollars, I think she mentioned that 1.6 trillion dollars, were um, lost in unaccountable spending. And he just said, that's impossible. That's like, that's a ridiculous amount of money. That cannot be true. And so he began going through expenditures uh, line by line of the United States uh, Pentagon over from 1998 up until 2015. So nearly 20 years. And started to become astonished at what he was discovering. And then he brought in his graduate students. And so he had a team of them. They were all going through. Uh, line items of Pentagon spending. Not quite the same as an audit, but as close as you're going to get from a bunch of outsiders. And they came to uh, $20 trillion of money that the Pentagon uh, cannot account for over a 17-year uh, period, and then $1 trillion from HUD. Housing and Urban Development, a $1 trillion from that. And, and the thing is that um, that number is almost absolutely, virtually, certainly way low, because they're not even done. Like, there are elements of the, of the federal budget, federal government, excuse me, that they haven't even gotten to. So this is just from what they've been looking at. They've come up, they're up to $21 trillion. And at that point, it made the news because that amount is actually equal to the entire debt of the United States of America. Like, that amount of money could conceivably pay for the entire debt of my nation. It's unbelievable. So, um, so at that point, it made the news, and a few news uh, sources repeated it. Um, so the question is, where is where's that money going? And um, I'm going to suggest a couple of answers. So one answer is it's going underground. And one answer is it's going off-world. So underground, um, this is a map. I, I don't know that this is an accurate map. I can't say that. This, is, this map, uh, this type of map's been around for 20 years. So there have been claims, and, and ditto with the one to the left of it, uh, locations of underground bases. I mean, my goodness, over 20 years ago, Phil Schneider was talking about over 100 clandestine underground bases that were off limits. Um, and, uh, and I don't know what the actual number is. I mean, I'm looking into it now. I'm trying to figure this out. If any of you have some insight into this, I would really be interested in hearing what you have to say to me. 
Um, but we can assume that there's a large number. You know, a number of years ago, Richard Souter published a book called Hidden in Plain Sight. I was his publisher. And uh, he did a very good job there, in my opinion, of showing the plans to go deep underground, going way back to the 1960s and 50s, actually. The money is not really that uh, uh, considered impossible back then to do it. The technology, this is one such, uh, uh, I think that's called the big inch, if I'm not mistaken, to go deep, deep underground and just carve through these massive structures. It can be done. The capability has been there for a long time. The only question is how many of these exist. And that's where investigators are trying to figure out, like, how accurate is this claim and how accurate is that claim? But I think uh, it's not outrageous to think, to think that there's at least 100 uh, fully functioning deep underground bases in the U.S. alone. Uh, Canada, I'm sure, is loaded with them, and uh, I'm sure they're throughout the rest of the world as well. And that would include, uh, in, I mean, even if it seems astonishing to you, under the, under the seabed. Uh, after all, we have tunnels connecting uh, regions under seabeds. You've got the Channel Tunnel connecting Britain to France. We've got in uh, New York City, we've got uh, the Lincoln Tunnel and the Holland Tunnel. They go under the ground. In Japan, there's a uh, a series of tunnels that go for, I think, uh, more than 20 miles under the ocean floor. So we know how to do it. Uh, the, the only question is, how extensive is it? I mean, it's an incredible thing to ask yourself, how do they get oxygen down there? But all this technology exists. It's, all, it's existed for years and years. So um, underground, though, is expensive. I've been trying to uh, do some investigation into this, and there's no question, like, uh, an above-ground facility versus a below ground facility, there's no question of what is more expensive. Below ground, it's a, a factor of not less than five and probably a factor of 10 or more to uh, properly build an uh, underground facility that you could otherwise build above ground. So it's a lot of money. I mean, you've got all these issues, not just excavation. You've got site analysis, geological surveys. You have to make sure that you, you're actually building in an area that's going to work for you. Then there's all of the special needs, not just air ventilation, but water drainage, uh, water prevention, transportation under the ground. Is that? That's a noise. Okay, I don't know what that is. Um, I was uh, reading a, um, some studies done by uh, the state of uh, Wisconsin was just doing a study comparing underground versus above ground electrical transmission lines, a very simple thing. And they were looking into it and they said it's, it's uh, four to 14 times more expensive to go below ground than above ground. And they were just trying to factor out the cost. So what's very obvious is that it's very, very expensive to build underground. There's got to be a lot of money going into under, underground facilities. And aside from that, just to manage the security and secrecy of underground facilities, probably not cheap either. Uh, keeping prying eyes away through bribery and threats, who knows what else, but there's a, a great deal involved going underground. So everything, all the costs go way up. And with space, it has to be even more, has to be more than even underground. Uh, just the whole infrastructure of doing anything in space. Um, so in space, um, I was reading, uh, so the cost of building a space station, conventional estimates of building a space station, uh, $100 billion is not an outrageous amount to envision for one space station. That's a lot of money. Now, I'm not saying that we have secret space stations out there. In fact, I don't believe that there are secret space stations. I think those would be detectable, very easily detectable. Um, unless you can cloak them. Maybe that's the case. But, but I will say <laughs> that, um, <clears throat> that there are other technologies um, that are very expensive. And I've got 10 minutes. Oh, that's Victor. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Victor. 10 minutes, correct? I've been here 10 minutes. Have you? No, come on. Well, here's, you have to understand the lights are coming out. I can't see anybody. I can't see you. So it's, it's interesting. I know you're there. That's as good as I can get. Thank you. Um, so the, uh, what was I saying? Oh, so, um, so space is expensive. And I've been thinking, so... Uh, you have people with these sightings of the big black deltas, that is the big black triangles. And uh, these are clearly expensive. They're not cheap. So is it possible to hide a space fleet of these big black deltas? And I think, yes, absolutely, it really is. Because they 
if, if everything that I'm thinking is right, is if they're operating on different types of principles of propulsion, they don't need to be in orbit. So if something is in orbit, then it's easy to detect. Then astronomers can know how to find something. But think about it. If you're really working with off the grid, off the uh, charts technology, which I think they are, they don't need to do something as mundane as put a, a satellite in orbit where it can be easily detected and where its path is very um, predictable. That's old school, all right? The new way would have to be an object that's in a much more unpredictable path. And if you're, they're using uh, some form of field propulsion technology or anti-gravity propulsion one way or another, that's easy. And uh, so you could have some very, very expensive, large triangular craft, which I think some of them at the very least are being manufactured by us, probably Boeing, and um, probably a lot of other corporations are involved in this, but to go off world. Um, and that would have to be the solution. So you, it, would be, it would be very, very easy to conceal that from telescopes. I mean, it would be almost a, a snap of the finger, so easy. Uh, so the question is, how expensive are those? And um, I mean, I've read estimates that they could be $5 billion a piece or more. If you have a fleet of 20, that's $100 billion right there. And maybe, th maybe they're more expensive than that now, probably. So I think that there's a lot of uh, capability for having a clandestine fleet. But that would be a very, very expensive proposition. If there were to be a clandestine base on the far side of the moon, for example, and I do believe the US intelligence community has been very interested in the far side of the moon for a long, long time, um, you would think, well, that's impossible. How could they build a base there? But it's really not impossible. It's not impossible. If you've got uh, off the charts technology that is being concealed from the public, which I think is true, uh, then what you need is you need oxygen and you need water. And you need to just ship supplies of food in. I mean, the food is no big deal if you've got the craft that can go back and forth pretty easily. After all, uh, there are bases, Canada has a base in the northernmost part of the world called CFS Alert. It's in the middle of nowhere. They got 50 guys there year round and they, all their supplies are being flown in by, by aircraft because there's no stores up there. Um, so you have to supply these bases with all their food and all their provisions if they're in a remote place. Antarctica, same thing. So it would have to be the same as an off-world destination. You just, and if you've got the tech to do it, you bring them their food that way. Then the only other issues are oxygen. Well, if you have an underground facility, off-world, that makes it easier, right? A self-contained facility, a way to generate oxygen. No doubt that they can do this. And then there's water. And now we're finding that the Moon and Mars both do have their own native supply of water, uh, or you just bring the supplies in. Um, that's why I think that these, some of these enormous craft are being seen, and this is why I think uh, some of them are our own, because they are the logical uh, sort of transportation vessels that the black budget world might use to supply off-base facilities. And I know uh, when this gets out, uh, this is gonna put me right out there along with some of the uh, other whistleblowers that I've had public disagreements with. But the fact is, I don't, I don't think that we don't have a secret space program. I do think we have one. And I think that this is probably a big way that it's being done. Um, I don't know why I had this, this uh, slide up here for you, actually. So I'm just going to skip right past it. <laughs> so, um, so what does a, a secret space program cost? I don't really know. It's got to cost in trillions of dollars. Uh, it's got to cost trillions and trillions of dollars. It's an expensive proposition. And that's just assuming you have a clandestine uh, presence in Earth orbit and Moon, not even getting into Mars. Years ago, when I was a, a new researcher in this field and just really learning about the anomalies of Mars and wondering what I thought about it, I wrote to one uh, scientist who thought was very well uh, connected. And, I intentionally disparaged uh, some of the claims about Mars just to gauge his reaction. He wrote back, he says, you really shouldn't do that. A lot of us are taking those anomalies very seriously indeed. And at that point, that was in 02, 03, a long time ago. Uh, so ever since then, I've, I've been sitting up and paying attention to Mars. Although I don't really know for sure what's going on there, but I would not be surprised in the least if we've got a clandestine presence there. Uh, 
if for no other reason than to look at the actual anomalies that are there. Uh, of course, they would go there and investigate them. Uh, but also, if you wanted to have a defense station, uh, you really, I can't see you wanting to go much further out than Mars, uh, because once the, uh, you go out past the asteroid belt to get out to Jupiter and beyond, th those revolutions take a long, long time. And I could just imagine it would be militarily very difficult uh, to defend Earth if you're stationed on an asteroid on the opposite end of the solar system, like you're really not going to be very useful uh, necessarily. So um, Mars would be a little bit easier. It's closer. I'm just thinking, this is my own thought. I don't really know what uh, the experts who are involved in this are actually concluding. So, um, oh yeah, and then let me just talk a little bit about Donald Trump's announcement of the Space Force. Um, I think this has been an inevitability for a long time. Uh, you know, there have been calls uh, since, I mean, Stephen Greer's press conference of 01, where they talked about the need to de-weaponize space. I thought, well, that's a really nice idea. That's never going to happen. Like, I mean, seriously, that's total fantasy land. That's like going back 100 years ago to the First World War and saying, we need to stop weaponizing the air. Like, are you kidding me? Uh, this is inevitable. It's an inevitability. So space is going to be weaponized. I mean, you can like it or not, but it's an inevitability. It's like saying, uh, you know, if the United States is never, is never ever going just unilaterally to say, We're, we don't want to dominate the world anymore. Like, that's never going to happen. <laughs> like, so, and for them to dominate the world, they need to dominate space as their theater of operations. This is not a negotiable thing for the U.S. national security community. They must dominate space. That means they've got to have, the NRO's got to have their spy satellites up there and who knows what else and they need them up there because none of those smart bombs are going to work if they don't have the targets exactly, you know, uh, targeted by the satellites. And, and then the adversaries are going to try to take the satellites down and you're going to have to defend them and it's a, it's a war in space. Inevitability. So um, that I it was just foolish, really. I mean, I don't want to be a Monday morning quarterback, but that was foolish, idealistic talk that was never going to go anywhere. Um, uh, there is actually a lot of pushback that you're seeing in the U.S. military against the Space Force, and that's simply because the Navy's got their own space operations, the Air Force has got their space operations, the Army has space operations. They're all out there, and none of them want to lose their, their uh, control over that to, ha to have an independent force that would be a unified command. So there's probably going to be resistance for a number of years, uh, could be, for, against this, but I think uh, I'm going to guess that it will go through and it will happen. Um, I think uh, geopolitically, in just terms of conventional politics, probably good timing uh, for Trump to make this decision. After all, he's, they're worried about the Chinese, they're worried about the Russians, they're worried about the Indians. Everyone's getting out into space, and the United States' attitude is, we're going to dominate. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do from an ethical point of view. I'm just saying from a purely power political point of view, it's inevitable. Uh, it's also good timing in terms of a secret space program, though. So if you've got a secret space program, which they do, um, you know, then you're going to need an increasingly better cover of operations for that program, uh, a shield, as it were. So uh, to, to engage in very, very um, extensive operations beyond you need to have something substantial, I think, in place to um, be the kind of first level of, um, of visibility. And so I think that's pretty obvious. And uh, it could have happened under President Obama, to be quite honest. It, I mean, there's, there's really no inherent reason why it didn't. It just um, didn't happen, so it's happening now. And um, so I don't really, I'm not going to pretend that I have much more inside information on this Space Force thing. I mean, it's, uh, I don't have any people on the inside of the Trump White House that give me the information, but uh, maybe some other people do. So I'm getting toward the end here. Um, the UFO cover-up has, uh, as I say here, facilitated the development of a breakaway civilization. And again, at a time when those elites above us, I'm just going to use that word um, figuratively, <coughs> are openly embracing a post-human utopia or post-human dystopia for the rest of us. Um, think, you know, it, it could have happened, let's say, like 100 years ago. Well, the world was very much an unequal place 100 years ago, but the ideology was a little different in many ways, and the, uh, the freedom of the press was actually very different. If there had been 
I'm just speculating here, but I can at least envision that uh, the UFO phenomenon could have been handled a little differently in a slightly different phase of our development. That's just, just my thought. But anyway, it's happening now. And um, as a result, uh, I think tomorrow I'm going to be on a disclosure panel, and I'm looking forward to it. And I believe in disclosure. I've, I've never stopped believing in it, but I've never believed that disclosure will be done in an honest way. Um, I think disclosure of the UFO reality will only be done, ever only be done, in a way where the, uh, those people with the power and the secrecy are forced by events, and they will just, uh, disclosure will have to be pried out of their cold, dead fingers. It's the only way it's going to happen. Uh, they're not going to do it willingly. And, and, <laughs> and, and I don't think they're going to do it honestly. I just don't think so. Uh, you know, organizations like the CIA have been managing this since forever, and they're just not going to walk away from the table and say, okay, you know, here's all the truth now. Um, they probably have truths that they're concealing that they would consider very disruptive and, and maybe scary. And I, I understand that. So the idea would have to be, we're going to give you a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. And I think that is probably the case, uh, whether they do or do not have our best interests in, in heart. And some people, uh, like the, the, uh, the, to the Stars Academy, believe that they have our best interests at heart and other people think that the CIA and the national security apparatus do not. I'm of the latter category. Not that there aren't good people in there, but um, I just don't think that institutionally they've done anything other than work for the financial elites, like the Rockefellers who helped create the CIA, which is the case. The Dulles brothers were CIA, were Rockefeller lawyers. I mean, it never changes. It never changes. Um, William Casey, you know, when he directed the CIA, same thing. They all work for the same people. So I think the goal uh, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I think the goal is a long night of global totalitarianism. That's what we're moving toward unless we do anything to stop it. That's, I think, going to happen. And uh, our job is to stop it. Our job is to confront it. So the way that we can do it, and, and this is something that all of us can do, is to uh, be brave and to recognize. The first thing is to recognize that there's a problem. So it's not to pretend that uh, if we only you know, work on increasing our vibrational frequency, that's going to all become better. That's not a bad thing to do, and we should all strive to be better people, but uh, we have to re re recognize that we're in a very, very uh, desperate system of control that is going from bad to worse every day. So until we see the magnitude of what's going on, I, I think it's pretty hopeless. Um, we have to see it. We have to speak the truth. We have to do whatever we can to inspire other people. And that means you, the next time you go back to your home and you're speaking to your relatives and your family, um, tell them what you did this weekend. Tell them what's going on. Tell them that, that, uh, that this phenomenon is actually real. It's taken seriously. It's not a joke. And it matters. It matters to everyone. Uh, and as long as we're in a, a world where the most fundamentally transformative reality is being denied to us, officially speaking, and it's still true, even today, uh, then we're in really big trouble. Uh, I guess I, I've developed the opinion that a dedicated, committed, ethical minority can actually transform this world. I was convinced of this recently, and I, I think it's true. I'm going to believe it's true for the time being. That we, and uh, someone wants to clap there, I saw that. Uh, that we, that's right. So, um, and the other thing I would just say is, uh, if, if things always seem hopeless and despairing, uh, I remind myself that that's the story of human history. It's just always been that way. There's always been injustice. It's never been otherwise, never been otherwise. Always been suffering. Uh, we've, we've had a tough time. We've had a great time, but it's been tough, and it's no different now. So we just have to recognize this is our newest challenge, and it's a challenge that we can meet. Uh, we are in the most transformative period in human history. That's the truth. So um, we can use that to our benefit and recognize that, um, that in a time of great flux and change, there can be really good things that come out that can force change, and, and it will be dramatic and it will be difficult and upsetting and all of that. But the fact is, we're never really going to get to where we need to be without some dramatic changes. The way it is right now, we're, we're in this kind of enforced uh, system of childhood. 
And uh, we're never going to get to adults until we actually rip some of these illusions away from us. We can do it. This is my, uh, my new website, it's Richard Dolan Members, and um, uh, Tracy and I have been really working it hard. I would encourage you to go take a look. My calendar's on there if you ever want to know what I'm up to. Uh, I've got articles uh, for the public and for members, and it's just all there, video, audio, blogs. Uh, I've, I'm shocked at how much is on there now. I would encourage you, if you want to see uh, what I'm up to these days, go to richardolanmembers.com. And with that, I want to thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you.